In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's theme is going to be on the light of grace. The light of Christ, who is the light of the world that illuminates the human mind in order to guide the will to unite itself completely with the divine will. Before we begin, let us pause for a few moments of reflection, meditation, and silence, which are essential to penetrate the mysteries of the writings of the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta. Because in silence, God disposes us to his hidden mysteries. Silence is perhaps one of the most underrated teaching instruments that we have at our disposal in the church's catechesis. Silence is the occasion for God to communicate to us. And it's essential to understand the inner meaning, the mysteries of the writings of the servant of God, Louisa. It is one thing to relate what Louisa intends to say or teach in her writings. It is another to fully apprehend the inner meaning of her intended words. And this is why when one reads the writings of Louisa, be it the Hours of the Passion, the Blessed Virgin Mary book, the volumes, the rounds of the soul throughout creation, the childhood memoirs, her letters. One must always season these readings with silence and reflection. You see, the readings of Louisa are not simply to be read, no more than the rosary is to be said. But rather, the writings of Louisa are not to be read, but to be meditated, much like the rosary is not to be said, but to be contemplated. And none of this can happen without silence and reflection. Let me give you an example. I'm going to read to you a passage from our Lord. Just read it, not meditate on it. And after reading it, engage your attention by asking you to meditate on it. First, let's read it together. In creating man, this is the Father speaking to Louisa, with the Son and the Spirit, the Trinity. In creating man, our divine will came forth from our supreme being. While all of our attributes naturally and subsequently concurred with our operation. Greater than the sun, my will emitted its rays, whose tips formed in man's soul his human will, which animated his human nature. All right, now this passage taken from volume 19, September 7th, 1926, doesn't really strike a chord in our soul just from that reading now, does it? It's a little bit confusing, isn't it? It's a little bit deep. So what do we do? We keep reading. Actually, no, that's not what we do. When we don't understand something in Louisa's writings, whether it's due to her poor Apulian grammar or the even worse present translations in English, and some of them are pretty terrible. I mean, all props and hats off to the people who help translate. God bless their good intention. But in not knowing the idiomatic expressions in Italian and the context of Louisa's intended transmission of God's word. The translation becomes even more confusing. Now, what I just shared with you, I myself translated from Italian to English, as I did all the other writings of Louisa in my dissertation approved by the Pontifical University of Rome. So let me now go from reading to meditating on this simple sentence that I just read to you. Again, the Trinity relates, in creating man, our divine will came forth from our supreme being. Let's stop right there. What does that mean? It means that the divine will was within the Holy Trinity's 
nature, not person, nature. This is important. And this is the importance of reflection, praying, instruction. You see, there is a difference between the divine persons, plural, and the divine nature, singular. Three persons in one God. One divine nature, three distinct yet inseparable persons. To which of the two, that is, to nature or to person, to which of the two does the divine will pertain? And from which does the divine will emerge or issue forth? Let me read that sentence, the beginning of that sentence again. And now ask you to meditate on it, engage your attention. In creating man, our divine will came forth from our supreme being. And the word being is God himself, both nature and person. But more specifically and theologically, the divine will is not a property of the person of God, but a property of the nature of God. Let me give you <clears throat> an analogy by way of our human nature. Okay, you are a human person. I am a human person. All creatures conceived are human persons. Except one. Jesus Christ. He is a divine person who pre-existed his human nature. His divinity existed without beginning, but his human nature had a beginning in time, thanks to the virgin birth. But even Mary and all of the human beings that were created have a human person. And this separates us from confusion with the deity. It keeps us from being new agers, so to speak. We do not become God living in the divine will, we remain human persons, but participate in the divine nature. So the divine will emerges from the divine nature of the three divine persons. And it is one, much like the divine nature. It's not three, you see? If the divine will emerge from the divine person of God and not the divine nature, there would be three wills in God. One for the Father, which is distinct from that person of the Son, which is distinct from the person of the Spirit. But because it comes from the divine nature of God and not his divine person, persons, it is one will common among all three, just like the divine nature. And therefore, when Christ came to earth and took upon himself, the second person of the Trinity assumed a human nature, grafting it to his pre-existent divine nature that had no beginning. He forever, as Jesus tells St. Catherine of Siena, created the bridge between God and wounded human nature, wounded by original sin. Christ did this through his passion, death, resurrection, and sending forth of the Holy Spirit. And I, if I said this once before, I'll say it again, and we'll never tire of saying it because it is grossly neglected by the church. Without the sending forth of the Holy Spirit, there is no church. We read in Catholic literature, through Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, we are saved. That's not exactly true. It's true, but it's incomplete, therefore it's not exactly true. If you leave out the sending forth of the Holy Spirit, there is no church. There are no sacraments. There, are, there is no priesthood. There is no Eucharist. So when we say Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, let us not forget, no less important is the sending forth of the Holy Spirit, which is the beginning of the actualization of the divine will on earth as in heaven. It is the Holy Spirit who brings about the gift of living in the divine will in us. Not just Jesus Christ, 
but also the Holy Spirit, the third fiat of sanctification. So in creating man, the triune will of God, which is one among the three, one will among all three persons, a property of their divine nature, issues forth from their supreme being. And when Jesus speaks of his being, here he's also referring to his, it's known in Greek as usia, essence. Because the divine will is God, it's his essence. And because God's essence cannot be communicated to us without grace, it comes to us by way of the second person of the Holy Trinity and his human nature, which received grace. Hence the importance of entering into the divine will by means of Christ's humanity. Without grace, we cannot accede to the uncreated grace of the divine will, which is the essence of God. We attain to the uncreated grace through the created grace that Christ's humanity received. His divine nature did not receive gra need grace. God is uncreated grace, but the created grace is humanity needed. Now I'm using these Oriental, Eastern, patristic adjectives. These are not often found, hardly ever found in the Western scholastic church, the Western Catholic church that is uncreated and created grace. These are terms used by the Eastern Orthodox and even Byzantine fathers today and before the schism of 1054 were used by all Eastern fathers who were at the time one with the Catholic Church. Now, I cannot simply mention East-West Catholic, Catholic Orthodox without adding that we, in God's eyes, are one church. We're not two. Some people are offended by that. But if you think about it, and you read the Pope's encyclicals, namely Pope John Paul II's encyclical on the two churches being two lungs in one body, one body of Christ. Wherefore, he created both the Eastern Code of Canon Law and, the, of course, the Western existed, which he helped create in 83. He was, a, he was coronated pontiff in 78. To bring about this unity that was in the beginning, but that now is suffering because of the schism of the 11th century. And this is also why Pope Francis plans on going to Russia, the first Pope in human history this year, to help bridge that which was broken, the unity that Christ intended from the beginning among all bishops, all priests, and all faithful within his church. There should not be a Protestant church, a Catholic church, an Orthodox church. These should not exist. There should be one church of Christ, united in the truth, under the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, whom the early church fathers and even the apostles acknowledged in Peter and his successors, but also united with the brother priests, including the patriarchs, and the pastors and the priests. God wants unity in truth. You see, there's a thing that many of us overlook in the Catholic Church when it comes to true ecumenism, not false ecumenism. False ecumenism denies true doctrine. True ecumenism never changes doctrine. Doctrine does not change. Discipline changes. And it has always changed since the beginning of the church. We find it in the Acts of the Apostles how the apostles were imposing certain disciplines upon the um, faithful, even at the Council of Jerusalem found in the Acts of the Apostles. And in the Didachea attributed to the 12 apostles, that work that they wrote of pertaining to discipline in the early church. One thing we have to realize is that there must be unity in diversity. This is true Catholicism. The word Catholicism means universality. It doesn't mean a small little group, a small little church. It means it's open to everyone in the truth. For the truth will set you free. And the church is truth. We know cannot separate itself from 
sacred tradition, which is unchanging doctrine that goes all the way back to the time of the apostles and their fathers and the doctors to the present, including magisterial teachings, which include documents, bulls, papal encyclicals, and motu proprios, and, and canon law, and the catechism, and so forth. But it also includes, in addition to sacred tradition, which is a living tradition, it's not something relegated to the past. It is alive today. That's what the Second Vatican Council calls tradition, a sacred living tradition. In addition to tradition, the truth is also sacred scripture. This is the bulwark, St. Paul calls of our faith, the foundation. So we have sacred scripture. We have sacred tradition. And then we have the third fount of our truth magisterial teachings, which do not deviate from either of the two, either sacred scripture nor sacred tradition. These three founts constitute the truth, and all Christians, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestants, can be united in this truth. And this is the hope of Jesus Christ today that we remain united in the truth while respecting diversity of rights and disciplines. So disciplines can change, but doctrine does not change. Therefore, even in the Catholic Church, we have different rights. Maronite right, Sulamara Parliament Bar right, which is the St. Thomas Christian right from India. We have the Armenian right, the Lebanese right, and the list goes on and on. Okay, now why did I bring this up? Because God, three divine persons in one divine nature, issued forth the divine will in and through the humanity of Jesus Christ, who wants us all to be one as he and the Father is one. The divine will is in, in its essence unitive. It unifies not just the human will with God's divine will, but it unifies all human wills of not just all Christians, not just all churches, but all believers in God. This is the dream of Jesus Christ, if you will. We are all created in God's image and likeness, regardless of what country we're born in, what race we are born to what religion we are brought up in, due to no choice of our own, but that of our parents. We are all God's children. And yet there is an objective truth God wants us to attain to, which takes time. This idea of you have to be, you know, you have to be Orthodox, you have to be Catholic, you have to be Protestant to be saved, has relevance only in so far as There is considered the context of each individual, which oftentimes is not depend upon the individual. Think about it. Did you choose to be born into the Catholic faith? Of course not. This is a choice of Almighty God who decided to give life to the human sea that your parents brought forth, who happened to be Catholic. What if you, just think of a moment, think for a moment, what if you were born in Asia? Let's say in Japan, which is over 80% Buddhist. Let's suppose you were born there. There's nothing stopping you from having been born there into a Buddhist family than from having been brought into life, to life into a Catholic family, except the will of God, the providence of God who preordained from eternity that you should have the grace of the light of faith. So when we speak of God's created being, his essence, issuing forth a divine will to us through the humanity of Christ, we must understand that this is not just for Catholics. It is for all mankind, but with patience, we must lead those who are not enlightened to the truth of Christ, to the truth. 
This is true ecumenism. It's open to the salvation of all. As St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans when speaking about the the Gentiles and the Jews. You know, I spoke of this a couple of weeks ago on Radio Maria. He says that because the Jews, the elect people of God of the Old Testament, chosen to receive the Messiah, rejected him, God then turned this favor to the Gentiles, to the non-believers. They became now the elect people of God. So you see, God wants all everyone to be saved. The plan of God was for the Jews to bring in the Gentiles, but since they rejected it, of course, Paul became the trumpet bearer of the truth to all nations, beginning with the Gentiles, and Peter to the Jews. But Paul adds in his letter to the Romans, I believe it's chapter 11, that in the end, even the Jews will come back, which he calls the cultivated olive tree, as opposed to the Gentiles, the wild olive tree. Both will be grafted onto the one will of Christ in the end. So, resuming this phrase that we read and then meditated upon in part, God tells Louisa, in creating man, our divine will came forth from our supreme being, while all of our attributes naturally and subsequently concurred with our operation. Now, what are these attributes of God? They are the internal the internal qualities of God, if you will. The attributes of God extend to his mercy, his justice, his love, his patience. All these, what we refer to as virtues in us, are qualities or attributes of God that he conveys to us through the grace that Christ received, that is, through the humanity of Christ administered to us. So when God gave his divine will to man in the beginning before sin, naturally and subsequently with the divine will were infused in him God's own internal qualities. Greater than the sun, S-U-N, my will emitted its rays whose tips formed in man's soul his human will. And here we arrive at the theme of light. God is here revealing that the light that he possesses, God is uncreated light. And Jesus Christ is an emanation of that light or we may make, say, a generation of that light. He's generated from the Father, light from light, true God from true God, without beginning or end. So this light of God, which is part of God, which is part of the essence of God, emitted its rays, whose tips formed in man's soul his human will. Imagine that. Picture in your mind's eye the clouds opening up, and out of the heavens, of sunbeam coming down into man not yet with life, just the body of Adam freshly made from God's creative hands. And with that sunbeam are contained, within that sunbeam are contained the divine attributes of God. And as they're entering into the body of man, penetrating his interior and his soul, they are infused within him within his will specifically, these attributes, which give life to man. Now you may say, wait a minute, didn't the Holy Spirit breathe into his nostrils and give him life? How can this light give him light, life? Jesus again tells Louisa, my will emitted its rays whose tips formed in man's soul his human will, which animated human nature. The word animate means bring to life. So what happened here at the creation of man is that the Trinity issued forth light into the body of Adam that was not yet with life. And this light penetrated his nostrils as breath. It penetrated his lifeblood. It penetrated his heart. 
and the heart was put into motion. It began to beat along with the lifeblood and the breath. The first thing that was put into motion was the breath, which enabled the heart to begin to pulsate. And that heartbeat put into motion circulation, Adam's lifeblood. All this is the result of God's light penetrating his body. Just as the sun's rays are bound to the sun, so the first human will in Adam was continuously bound to God's will, this light of God, which was his will. And just as the sun's rays pulsate around the sun, so Adam's soul pulsated around his creator. And his body and that of Eve, that of Eve, shone with the iridescence of the brilliance of this light that God gave them. To further illustrate this truth, let me quote to you from two passages of Louisa. One is taken from September 14th, 1923, which is volume 16. And the other, December 8th, 1923, volume 16 as well. Jesus relates, before man sinned, my divinity was not concealed from him. What does this mean? That Adam could see the light of God with his physical eyes. God gave Adam's and Eve's eyes the propensity not to be blinded while gazing upon the divinity. They could see the light of grace physically with their eyes. Before man sinned, my divinity was not concealed from him. By pulsating around the reflections of my light, he became my reflection and therefore my little light. So it was as though natural that this little light should be able to receive from me, the great sun, S-U-N, the reflections of my light. And that second passage from December 8th, before sinning, Adam possessed the complete life of my divine will in his soul. One can say that this soul was filled to the brim, to the extent of overflowing externally. Now, what does this mean? The light of God, the uncreated light of God that penetrated Adam's soul, overflowed outside of his soul onto his body, forming a garment of light that Adam and Eve could visibly see, and so could the creatures. The Blessed Virgin Mary illustrates this in the book of, for the month of May, where she said that when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost this light, and the Adam and the animals saw them as naked, meaning they had no more light. It receded back within their soul because they violated God's command, which merited death. Genesis chapter two, verse. It's verse. Um, 17, I believe. God tells Adam, if you partake of the fruit, the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will certainly die. That adjective certainly is important. It means there was no doubt in Adam's mind that he would die if he committed sin. So Adam should and Eve should have died in that moment. But thanks to the mercy of Christ, who from all eternity deigned to take upon himself the consequences of our power and sin, and therefore come to the salvation of the human race and us. But before Adam and Eve sinned, their bodies were, were overflowing with light. And therefore, Jesus tells Louisa, one can say that before one can say that Adam's soul was filled to the brim to the extent of overflowing externally. Thus, by virtue of my will, his human will transfused light externally and emitted the fragrances of his creator, fragrances of beauty, sanctity, purity, which engendered perfect health and strength. Well, see, these are the attributes God refers to earlier in that passage I cited to you from September 7th, 1926, volume 19, where Jesus said that the Trinity's attributes naturally and subsequently concurred with the operation 
of communicating the divine will to man's will through light. What are these attributes? The attributes of eternity is one of them, which gave Adam perfect health, perfect strength, sanctity, purity, beauty. All this was the natural consequence of God's divine will through divine light being transfused from the divine nature into the human nature of Adam, which engendered perfect health and strength. Such fragrances emanated from within Adam's will like many luminous clouds. Reflect, meditate on that phrase for a moment, and you will picture what Adam and Eve looked like. The fragrances that naturally concurred with the divine light of God entering into Adam's will were that of beauty, sanctity, purity, perfect health, and strength. And these fragrances emanated from within, from within Adam's will. You see, that's the soul like many luminous clouds. What does that mean? God put his light within the body of Adam, specifically within the soul, more specifically within the will, which is one of three properties of the soul, and the greatest of the three. In addition to the intellect and memory, there's the will. The will is the greatest because only in the will can acts be deposited, not in the memory, not in the intellect. And within the will is concentrated this uncreated light that contains the divine will of, of God. And this divine will emanated fragrances externally, like luminous clouds covering his body with light. Much like in the Old Testament, the cloud that came upon the tent of Moses, which was the church back then, the cathedral, was a prefigure of the divine will. This cloud in the Old Testament is the same cloud over, you may say, overshadowing and covering the bodies of Adam and Eve, and it was a cloud of light. It wasn't like a cloud you see in the sky that's about to give rain, a dark cloud. It was a luminous cloud. So Jesus reveals such fragrances emanated from Adam's body while like many luminous clouds within him came forth. While these exaltations so embellished his body with light, that it was a delight to behold him so beautiful, vigorous, luminous, and perfectly healthy with an enrapturing grace. So there you go. Adam and Eve literally glowed with light, not from without, but from within. It was divine irradiation, sort of like that which you receive when you're before the Blessed Sacrament. It's spiritual radiation therapy. Better than any right machine that produces light therapy. On February 24th, 1919, volume 22, we reveal, we, we, we hear from Jesus' revelation, everything you see in creation was absolutely nothing compared to the creation of man. Oh, how many more beautiful heavens, stars, and suns did God extend in the created soul? What a variety of beauty, how much harmony. It is enough to say that God looked at created man and found him so beautiful that he fell in love with him. Jealous of this portent of his, God himself became the custodian and possessor of man. And God said, I have created everything for you. I have given you dominion over everything. All is yours and you will be all mine. But you will not be able to comprehend everything, the seas of love, the intimate and direct relations, and the likeness that flows between me, the creator, and you, the creature. Ah, daughter of my heart. If man knew how beautiful his soul is, how many divine qualities he contains, how he surpasses all created things in beauty, power, and light, oh, how much more he would esteem himself. One can say that he is a little God and contains a little world within himself. 
Now, why does Adam contain a little world within himself, and why do we, therefore? Because within the soul, there are three properties, as mentioned, the greatest of which is the will. And only in the will can all acts of all creatures be deposited. You see? No other creature, not even the angels, can deposit divine acts within themselves. And this is why we, like no other rational being throughout the cosmos, throughout the heavens, throughout any place, time, or event, are created in God's image and likeness. Certainly the angels and other rational creatures reflect some of that image and likeness. But we contain the perfect image and likeness, a likeness of God like no other rational being or irrational being ever created or that will ever be. That is how much God values the human being more than any other creature ever made. And St. Paul acknowledges this truth. You know, St. Paul, when he wrote about the angels in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, he said, do you not know that we humans will judge angels? Now, at this point, let me take a break and remind you that Radio Maria, it's got some new workers, thanks be to God, they're all helping us. And they're all doing this voluntarily. And this is something that needs to be said because these are the unsung heroes, if you will, the first line responders to the divine will, at least concerning this program. On Radio Maria, we have all different types of programs. But they need your prayers. And also, they depend upon you, this whole broadcast for your monetary and prayerful support, because it's listener supported, 100% listener supported and commercial free. So please be generous and give as you have freely received, as God says. Now, back to the theme of light. Volume 23, October 6th, 1927. God reveals to Louisa, before Adam sinned, he formed as many sons in his creator for as many acts that he accomplished in my will. He formed as many sons in his creator. What does that mean? See, the difference between reading the writings and meditating in silence on the writings. Whenever we come to something like this and we don't understand it, the first thing we do, we pause and we reflect in silence. And if we still don't come to a full understanding of what this means, you can contact me. I have a website that posts answers to questions called livinginthedivinewill.org. Livinginthedivinewill.org or the anagram or the uh, abbreviation ltdw.org. And on it there's a Q&A, you can just type it in and I get it, and I reply to it accordingly. What does this mean? That Adam formed as many sons, S-U-N-S, in his creator for as many times as he accomplished his acts. In his creator signifies that while living in God, remember, <clears throat> Adam was within God. Jesus tells Louisa, when you live in the divine will, God becomes your temple. So Adam was residing within God. God was Adam's temple. So creating many sons in his creator signifies that while living in God, in his divine will, Adam formed many sons in his own will that were encompassed by the divinity. This cloud of light that surrounded Adam's body, these luminous clouds that formed a garment of light over Adam's body and Eve's body, was God. 
And it says as much in the Old Testament, God came down upon the tent in the form of a cloud. This was a luminous cloud that guided them in the night. There was a pillar of fire and a luminous cloud. The same God that entered within Adam's soul before Moses led the Israelites through Egyptian, through the crossing of the Red Sea and out of Egyptian slavery. And this cloud of light, which is God, preserving Adam's eternity, his eternal essence, his inability to die, that is before sin, his perfect health, his holiness, his purity, his sanctity, and all else, was that which empowered Adam to perform his own acts. So really, when Jesus is saying here that before Adam sinned, he formed as many sons in his creator for as many acts as he accomplished, he really means that Adam formed with God as many sons in God for as many acts that he accomplished under the influence of God. You see, because Adam's acts were really not Adam's acts. They were God's acts within Adam. God was the operator. Adam was the co-operator. My will alone has sufficient light to let the human will form sons. This is again the continuation of October 6, 1927, what I started citing from volume 23. My will alone has sufficient light to let the human creature form sons, S-U-N-S, and give this light to one who lives in it, within its properties, and not to one who lives outside of it. And on November 2nd, 1927, same volume 23, Adam had the power to form as many sons as he intended. Okay. Just as the Earth's sun, we have to understand what this, how Adam forms suns and what they look like. Remember, Adam had the ability, and so did Eve, to see the light of grace, to see the light of God surrounding their body and emanating from their acts. They had this visible grace to see the light that their actions produced. Since sin, all humans lost this visible grace of seeing the light of grace and seeing the light emanate from their acts. Not even Louisa was able to see this. The Virgin Mary had this ability. She kept it to herself. She kept it concealed. She reveals that she had this ability only in bits and pieces in the writings. Remember, Mary did not have the beatific vision. She was not confirmed in grace on earth. The beatific vision implies confirmation in grace, impeccability, impassibility. Mary on earth did not have the beatific vision. Okay, I just want to clarify that. She was not confirmed in grace on earth. Certainly she was conceived without sin, but she could have sinned until the last breath she drew which is why she was so great, though being able to sin, she never did. But she was given this grace of seeing things that the normal human sight is not capable of seeing. Take, for example, the wedding feast of Cana, where she says that she beheld all the souls that would ever be married, all marriages of all time. So God gave her certain view visions that most people don't have. And she was also given the vision of seeing internally everything Christ went through, everything he would suffer. But Jesus tells her that, Louisa, that a sort of bilocation took place between Mary and Jesus. She experienced everything he experienced, though she wasn't present wherever he was. So to understand how Adam was able to form as many sons as he intended, we must understand that just as the, the Earth's sun makes with its light, dark planets become like shining stars. So the divine will operating through grace in Adam's acts formed his soul into a spiritual star. 
The created light of the earth's sun symbolizes the brilliance of God's divine will that infused within Adam's soul, God's eternal operation, which empowered his soul's acts as raised from a divine sun. And clothe it as a royal garment to introduce itself into the center of the divine will as light into a lamp. <clears throat> as created light is an emanation of the most perfect material body in our solar system, the sun, so the divine light of God's will that imbued the souls of our first parents with grace is an emanation of the most perfect sun, namely the eternal sun, which is God himself. And this is found in volume 19. September 7th, 1926. God refers to himself as the eternal son. S-U-N. In volume 25, December 25th, 1988, God tells Louisa, Adam was the first human son, S-U-N, invested with our will. So this puts an end to this theory of pre-existent human beings before Adam and Eve. That's a bunch of nonsense. Don't be deceived by fake news. And there's a there's a program on television that's promoting extraterrestrials called ancient aliens, right? They're purporting they're purporting a, a false teaching that aliens created humans. This is completely fake and contradicts sacred scripture, <clears throat> contradicts Louisa's writings, where God tells Louisa that God formed Adam with his own hands, without any intermediaries. And the church teaches that God created Adam and Eve, ex nihil, out of nothing. Their soul came from nothing, not from any pre-existing thing. Certainly the body came from the existing clay, but not the soul. And even Pope Pius XII, in his encyclical Humani Genitis, states that the first human individuals were Adam and Eve, the first. And people have asked, well, wait a minute. Archaeological and geological findings can show through isotopic and limited carbon-14 testings that there were rational engravings in caves and fractions of bones referred to as cavemen that pre-existed 4,000 BC, when according to biblical genealogies, our first parents existed or were created. How can these two be reconciled if Adam and Eve were the first humans? And the answer is simple. These were not humans. <laughs> That's the answer. They were not human beings. So Jesus tells Louisa, Adam was the first human son invested with our will. His acts were more refulgent than the sun's rays, as through their extension and expansion, they were to invest the entire human race. Imagine that. Adam's acts were to cast shed light throughout all human generations for thousands and thousands of years without end. Had Adam not sinned, and Eve not sinned. The pulsations emanating from their bodies, from their divine acts, would have continued to circul circulate or encompass all human generations. And this, this light that would emanate from their acts, which was really the divinity within them, would continue to go from generation to generation to generation, much like the power that is communicated by apostolic succession, by the laying on of hands. Now, apostolic succession actually refers to teaching more than power, but it, it does not without power, because the laying on of hands is what communicates to the priest power to absolve and consecrate. If there is a break in the chain of this laying on of hands, there's no valid ordination. There's no power communicated. Similarly, the light that God put within Adam's soul and Eve's soul was to transmit unbroken chains of light to their progeny. Once this chain is broken, 
the progeny can no longer receive this influx of the uncreated light of God that contains the divine will. And that is why when Adam and Eve sinned, the light was broken for generations. Until God, from all eternity, preordained the birth of the servant of God, Louisa, who was to restore to wounded human nature this gift. Mary had it, but she did not enjoy the wound of original sin like Louisa did. And therefore, when Louisa received it, we being of her stock, or she being of human nature's wounded stock, would be able to receive it. So Adam's acts were to invest the entire human race, wherein one would see the many and the one as though pulsating within these rays. In this passage, December 25th, 1988, Adam was the first human son invested with our will. His acts were to invest the entire human race, wherein one would see the many and the one as though pulsating within these rays. All were to be centered in the first human son. And all were to acquire the virtue of forming their own sons without ever being severed from their link from the first son. Sort of like, if you see in Russia, the Matrushka dolls, <laughs> I think that's what, the, um, I stayed in Russia, I visited Russia for a few months on two separate occasions. The Matrushka, is a little Russian doll, right? It's a handmade um, wooden doll. And one is uh, placed within the other, within the other, within the other, within the other, right? So you take at the top the head off the Matrushka doll and you find another one within it. You take the head off of it, you find another one within it, and so on and so forth. And they go on to like six or seven or nine dolls, all one within the other. Well, that's similar to what the Lord is explaining here with Adam being within God, who is the temple of Adam, and all other human beings with being within Adam, one within the other. And this is what Jesus means when he says, all were to be centered in the first human son, and all were to acquire the virtue of forming their own sons, without ever being severed from their link with, within, with the first son. Okay, we have one more minute left. Let me begin to conclude. I'll continue this theme next week of next week of light, the light, the uncreated light of God operating within the creative light, created light through the humanity of Christ in human nature. May the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you and illuminate your minds through the light of God, through silence, meditation, reflection upon the writings of Louisa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 